relatively there we go. It looks relatively nice outside. So I hope everyone is having a good morning and enjoying the weather outside. Um, we're gonna get started now. So Kabir, I don't know if you can screen share just so we have the title of the webinar up. Okay, so today we'll be talking about the factors influencing the adoption of digital technologies in Ontario rainbow trout farming. Before we begin, I just want to acknowledge the land that we um, will learn where we work, where we play. It's very important to do land acknowledgements for things like this. Um, so while we all might physically be in different places, this is a webinar that is being hosted by the University of Guelph. I'm a University of Guelph student. My name is Isha. I forgot to introduce myself in the beginning. Um, the University of Guelph resides on the traditional lands of the Atawandran people and the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We also honor our, our, our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors and recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant. The Dish with One Spoon Covenant is not only a promise between nations for peace and prosperity, but it is also a promise to the land itself. In the context of the treaty, uh, the dish represents the land, the spoon, or it, or the absence of utensils such as a knife represent not only that we eat out of the dish and we're sustained from it, but it's a sign of peace. And the agreement binds all those who inhabit the land to live sustainably by sharing resources and acting in peace and love, not war. I'd like to encourage everybody to take some time to learn about not the land that you might currently be on, but any land that you might have the opportunity to visit in the future or anyone you've visited in the past and items that are sacred to those people. Acknowledging them is an act of reconciliation, reminding us of how important our connection is to each other and our shared responsibility of this land where we live, learn, work, and play. So with that, I'm gonna get started with the webinar. So this is a project that is led by the Ontario Every Food Innovation Alliance KTT funding and was started in 2021. It's being led by two University of Guelph faculty, Dr. Athahal Jodhri, who's from the School of Environmental Design and Rural Development, and Dr. Dominic Burrow from the Department of Animal Biosciences. Last year, there was another webinar um, around the same time before the survey was done, before the project was kicked off. And this is the second webinar. We're going to share a little bit about the results that we've obtained and a little bit more and have a little bit more of a discussion on the adoption of digital technology in rainbow trout farming in Ontario. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Oh, one second. And this is who our panelists are. Me, sorry, it's just taking a second before it wants to share. There we go. So can everyone see my screen? Just thumbs up. Yeah. Kabir, can you see? Okay, perfect. There you go. So um, we have Tyler, who is the principal scientist and the aquaculture science services lead at Innovacy. So Tyler, do you want to just unmute and maybe turn your camera on so everyone can see who you are? So yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, pleasure so to be here. Yeah, we have Tyler and then we also, um, Stefan is also here and he is the sales of, the director, sorry, of sales and customer service at Wataya Aquas. So Stefan, would you mind in unmuting and turning your camera on so folks can see you? Yes, hello. Um, hello everybody, I'm currently in the UK. Uh, so I'm joining from the UK, I'm taking a little bit of vacation, but important to be here, so happy to be here. Um, and uh, so Kana Upton also is our other panelist um, from Aqua Cage Fisheries. Um, yep. If you want to just unmute, so. Sorry, I don't know. I still don't know how to change my name yet. So I'm not <laughs> third orange. I'm Kana Upton. Okay. Hi, everybody. Okay. Amazing. So these will be our panelists and they will be the ones discussing the results that will be presented now by Dr. Kabir. He's also involved in this project and he's, I'm just going to stop sharing. There we go. Um, so Dr. Kabir, he is also um, part of the University of Guelph and he will be sharing our findings. So the floor Great, is yours. You. Yeah, please just let me share the screen. I hope you can see it right now. 
Perfect. Yeah. So welcome everyone. Good morning from uh, Goa of Ontario. And uh, yeah, welcome to our webinar uh, at the end of this year on factor influencing the adoption of digital technologies in the rainbow trout farming in Ontario. So I'm working with Professor Atarulak Choudhury and also Professor Dominic uh, uh, with, with this project since last two years. And uh, yeah, we got some results from this survey that I would like to share in this uh, webinar. So before starting into this presentation, I would like to share one quotation that we received from uh, one of our participants. You can see here what this producer and practitioners mentioned. So he mentioned that we adopted technology slowly compared to other industries. Cost and experience are key drivers in digital adoption. And younger farmers are more comfortable with the implementation and the use of digital services. And this industry has long way to go. So this is kind of masses that we received from our survey that this industry has a long way to go regarding the adoption of technology, uh, regarding the productivity, regarding the market expansions and so many things. So to explore those aspects, this project is basically uh, conducted to understand what are the factors influencing the adoption of digital technology in rainbow trout farming. And for that, we, con we, we considered a, a very well-established methodology, which is called Q-methodology, to understand the subjective perception of our farmer, researcher, technology producers, or providers, and other stakeholders within this uh, farming community to understand what are the constraints, what are the hindrances preventing rainbow trout producers from adopting digital technologies. So there are a number of technologies available, but we consider only digital technologies, and we define digital technologies as of uh, smart farming tools or techniques that widely used um, in, in our system to generate, store, process, transmit, and display information using binary code. And our producer, they basically use digital technology with the expectation that it will improve the efficiency, enhance the traceability, and help better decision-making capacities. So we started our survey early this year between April to July, and we sent um, invitations within the community, especially within the rainbow trout farming communities. We requested them to um, attend the survey. And when a participant accept, uh, accepted our survey, they basically got 27 statements. And these 27 statements is all about the factors that could influence the adoption of digital technologies. And uh, the, it, this survey was conducted in online. And uh, when they insert into the insert into the survey, they get uh, these statements and they have to just screening these statements into agree, disagree, and undecided uh, scale. In the next steps, they have to screen this in more um, specific scale that is strongly agree to disagree. So we basically get, try to go, get the perception about those statements, whether they're agree or disagree or undecided. And this data was collected through online survey. We also asked our respondents that please explain your reasons for strongly agree or disagree with certain statements. So why you agree with this statement? Why you disagree with this statement? So we also get a lot of explanation from our respondents. So what we basically actually found. So after several reminders and several uh, invitations sent, we got respondents from 23 actors. And you can see the actors, who are the actors. Among these 23 actors, 12 actors are producers and practitioners. And rest of the actors are from input dealers, researchers, from educational institute, and also from government officials. So this Q methodology that's, that we adopted, this methodology basically help us to uh, groove communities into, 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 into certain um, discourses based on their perception. So we went through a number of analyses. I'm not going to show here, but I'm going to show the basic results. So uh, these 23 respondents, they are divided into three groups based on their perspectives, how they perceive different factors adopt, influence adoption of digital technology. So you can see the first groups is contain eight respondents. 
Uh, the second group uh, contained nine respondents and the third group contained five respondents. And if I want to show you the details results, so this is the results. Among these eight respondents, this group basically producer and practitioner dominance. You can see five respondents are producer and practitioners uh, from these eight respondents. And this group, this group of people, they emphasize skill shortages and data related concern. You can see some statements here. For example, uh, one statement, the number three statements, respondents, uh, these respondents, they agree, strongly agree that the adoption of digital technology in rainbow trout farming involved a specialized or well-trained employee. But on the other hand, finding human resources with the necessary skill to work with digital technologies is difficult. And also they are very much concerned about the data ownership and the third party use of data. And these factors or these issues influence their adoption of digital technologies. You can also see a quotation from a producer and practitioner. So they mention that managing a farm using a digital technology is not necessarily more difficult in the long term if we can find people with the skill. So they basically emphasize the skilled manpower for this you uh, for the use of these digital technologies. For the group two, uh, the discourse to this group of people, they basically focuses on complexity and cost associated with digital technologies. And you can see also uh, the producer practitioners are dominant in these groups with uh, input dealers and government officials. And their main concern is about the complexity of use digital technologies. And they also mention, if you look at the quotation, I do think that there has to be an initial incentives to push us to adopt new technologies such as free trial or workshop. So this is kind of related to demonstrations of something that, okay, uh, we, you can add in some free trial for us, some workshop. And also this is associated with extension support. Uh, here they mention that lastly, I do think there has to be extension support to adopt new technologies. And these statements somehow indicate that there might be a missing link that extension services is not there to support farmers with this adoption of digital technologies. The final group of respondents, they emphasis or they have doubts about perceived values of the technologies. So they thought that our producer, they don't really perceive the value of digital technologies that can help in their farming pro process. You can see there, um, uh, some statements, for example, especially statements 13, the value of digital technology in trout farming has not been demonstrated and they strongly agree with, it, with that. So there are a number of technologies there might be, but it's not demonstrated in that way that producer can perceive the value of those technologies. So one researcher, yeah, he mentioned that there's a lack of understanding of the value of the monitoring and analytical capacities and sharing capacities with using these technologies. There is some aspects of data privacy which may also play a part. So these are the basic points. We got a lot of findings, but I don't want to share all the findings because of the time constraints. But yeah, we got these findings. Basically, uh, they're talking about skill manpower. They're talking about data privacy. They're talking about perceived value exchange of services, uh, cost and complexity associated with technologies. So what could be the implication of our findings? Obviously it can help guide intervention to promote adoption in futures, set some policy for a dissemination of technologies maybe, and also uh, some tailors of intervention for specific technologies maybe. It could be possible also uh, based on our findings. So this is our panelist, already Isham uh, introduced all of our panelists. Personally, I would like to thank everyone uh, that you accept my invitation to join this webinars. I'm really grateful looking forward for the discussion. I'm really excited to hear from uh, you about the findings and also uh, maybe the last things that I'd like to mention. We got some insight from our findings and now we would like to zoom in more with some specific technologies and want to look at how specific technology adoption actually happened in the in, in Ontario rainbow trout farming context. And that's why we're planning to run another survey uh, in the January, in the next January, next January, and I would like to request our 
community to please participate to help us in the survey. And finally, I would like to thank obviously knowledge translation and transfer funding programs, the KTT funding programs from Ontario Agri Food Innovation Alliance for funding these projects, also School of Environmental Design and Rural Development. And I would like to thank two persons, especially one is RJ Taylor from Ontario Agriculture Association uh, for his wonderful help with our survey, with all other things, with the projects. He, he's always helpful. And also Mike from uh, Omafra. Uh, he, he is a super person. He is also helpful uh, during our, our throughout our project. So I would like to acknowledge uh, all of the respondents also who participated in our survey. So now I would like to um, give the floor to Isha for the discussion and thank you everyone. Um, okay, there we go. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Kabir. So um, our three panelists, I would like to invite you folks, if you want to just kind of stay unmuted and keep your cameras on that way. Sometimes I know we start talking and then forget we're muted. So, um, but I have a few questions just to kind of help facilitate the discussion and I've sectioned them off. So the first thing I want to kind of ask, and I'll open the floor to I, any of the three of you to begin, um, the adoption of digital technology in rainbow trout farming appears to be very dependent on having very specialized or well-trained employees. Can you folks please elaborate on the specific skills or training that's required for these employees to effectively utilize digital technologies in trout farming? Yeah, I, I can start. Um, it's it's a difficult question because uh, digital tools describes a large number of different tools and a lot of them are being developed still and are just coming out. Um, Innova C had a press release yesterday with our new farm management technology. Uh, we're working on biomass assessment cameras that are, are really just being developed. We don't have an algorithm for a rainbow trout now. So how could you really expect to hire somebody that has training or experience with those tools it's kind of unreasonable. Um, with that said, there, there are tools that have been around longer and there is sort of a big advantage to hire somebody who has experience with uh, Fish Talk, Mercatus, um, some of the Innova C sensors, stuff like that. So I, I think it goes on both sides. Um, finding people with the experience in Ontario is difficult. Um, bringing in people from uh, places where there's a more advanced industry, such as the East Coast or West Coast, is probably not reasonable either. And so it's the best solution in my mind is just to reach out to your vendors, your uh, technology suppliers, and say, we want help. Um, you can get a sales tech or a customer support person out there uh, when you make the purchase. They can set up training. They can provide resources to help get you up to speed because they they want you to succeed with the tools. They don't want you to, to struggle with them to say, you know, we didn't like them. We didn't integrate them into our processes. Um, and I work for an equipment supplier, so I can say this. Uh, we want you to see the value. We want you to understand how to use them and to have success with them. And so that's probably the best solution, particularly with these new tools. Uh, some of the tools that are maybe more sophisticated um, it's reasonable to expect some to have computer savvy, maybe some statistical background, uh, but really not to understand AI or, you know, some of the more advanced stuff that's happening. So, so that's my first thought, but it, it is an interesting question and there's, there's not really an obvious answer, but I think working together, we can, we can improve that uh, situation. Yeah, I think that's a really, like, I really think that's an interesting take. Um, I don't know, uh, Stephen, Ken, I don't know if you folks have any yeah. other thoughts that you want to add or if you just want to jump in. No, I, th I think um, Tyler said some good things there about the fact that, um, it, I mean, it does depend quite a bit on the type of technology you're trying to implement, whether it involves sensors that are automatically putting data into a software platform or whether it's just a manual entry interface. Um, we at Wadaya, we've got a, a software platform and, and we're trying to move it around the world in aquaculture around the world. And I think there's a lot also of maybe fear of, of how this is going to change my day-to-day -day job. So how do, if I'm going to be interacting with this new technology, how is it going to affect me? Is it going to, is it going to save me time? Is it going to create more time for me to do it? And I think there's 
maybe when and mentioned some of the bigger ones like Mercadas and Fish Talk, etc. When you see those from a small as a smaller farming industry and you see some of the big ERP type systems, you do get kind of overwhelmed with everything they can do. And maybe once you have the opportunity to work with a customer to show them to work with an industry and show them the benefits they can get from just even the simpler parts of the software without going into the everything that it can do. Um, these are the small incremental um, improvements that you can make just through using this part of the software, or this part of the software. It's um, then I think it actually makes it a little less daunting of a task um, for the employees on a farm that what does this mean to me as a person um, and essentially a lot of people if you were in, if and I try to explain this to a lot of our customers especially um, in some a lot of the smaller farming industries around the world is if you can play on Facebook you can you can pretty much input data into a any of the softwares that are out there today so mm -hmm. It, it's an interesting thought. Instead of pitching technologies, you're really pitching changes to their workflows. And if you present it as sort of a holistic solution, as opposed to a piece of tech, uh, it might be easier to sort of integrate that or, or perceive the value in that. Um, another idea that uh, this actually came from the U.S. Soybean Council uh, they have a similar problem with there's uh, software for nutritionists and, and it's hard for graduates to get access to that. And so they're trying to start a program to get the technology into the graduate programs. And so as part of that, your schooling is not just theoretical, which is, it is and isn't depending on the school. Um, all programs are different, but they felt that if they could get their tech, the software uh, into the schools and the graduate students get some exposure to that. And then you can, um, you know, as somebody entering the workforce, you can put that on your resume, uh, you're a more attractive candidate. And it's it's sort of hard to do that at a level at a level lower than graduate school. Um, a lot of people come up with uh, uh, certificate degrees or just a, a bachelor's education. And it's just sort of, um, in my mind, there's just too many people. It's too hard. It's too generalized of a educational program to get specialized uh, software training. Uh, but if you're in a graduate program in aquaculture, it's not unreasonable to try and get access to these farm management softwares, even some of the sensors um, and the software that supports those. So that's an area that could also be explored. It is. Um, Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. I have brought some of these questions up to my coworker too. And we thought the same thing, Tyler, that if we had um, students in the aquaculture programs that had access to exactly like you said, some of these programs that they already had a taste for it before they came in, because it, obviously it seems to be um, something that the industry is always going to be moving towards and others have obviously adopted a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> and then the other hurdle for us seems to be like just from my own personal observations is that we've got some feeders and stuff that are um, that are older individuals and they don't, one of them doesn't even have a phone. So like that kind yeah. of stuff can be tricky for them. Yeah. Having like just simple demo videos so that it takes, uh, it doesn't take as much time for me to have to train every new employee. Like, okay, here's our phone. Here's how we're going to be entering the data, Morts, whatever something that it just removes the onus from the manager from the training perspective. So you're not continually training new employees and the same thing that would help too, I think. That's, that's a very good point. Um, and this is getting into adoption barriers, which I know is a topic we are going to discuss later, but. Um, yeah, that was, that was actually going to be the next question. I was like, <laughs> yeah. it's a really yeah. good segue. I, I, I hope you don't mind the discussion just flowing between topics. <laughs> I don't want to do it. Good. Yeah. yeah. I can, I, I do have like a question for adoption barriers. If you folks like, I can ask it to help frame their, like help you frame your response or if you want to just keep discussing. Yeah. Can I, before we go into adoption barriers, can I just make a point that we um have tried and actually we had um, Fleming College. I happened to be lucky enough during COVID to do some teaching at Fleming. Um, we also had a couple of institutes in Central America that had an educational license of our software so that all of their students that were working on uh, at the Fleming College hatchery or that were working in the hatchery in, at one of the schools in, in Ecuador um, had would, the idea was that they were going to be using this kind of software as a thinking that, okay, this is the kind of thing that I'm going to be exposed to once I get into the industry. 
and it's a hurdle. And maybe this also is part of a segue into adoption is it breaks down if you don't have buy-in everybody. The students seem interested in it, but if you don't have the educators saying, okay, this is a tool you should be using. This is a tool we should be using to help teach our students. Um, and then the and it works into the adoption on the farm as well, is if there's not a top-down buy-in of look, this is something we're using and you we should be using, whatever system it is, um, because oftentimes you get somebody that's interested in it um, one of the farm managers or one of the farmers, we tried, we had the OMNR using it as well with their hatchery system in Ontario and each hatchery. Well, yeah, I want to use it, but I don't really want to use it. I've got my old way of doing things. And, and so if there's not a full buy-in that this is something that the industry needs to use, and this is something we need to use. Then yeah. my segue into the, uh, that, but yeah, we tried it with the educational license. So we did have an educational licensing strategy um, and it's just, trying to get the school also to fund and be like, okay, this is something that is important to the industry. I think that's like that. I, I like how we've like been able to like kind of take it because as someone who like, you know, I have a little bit of an understanding um, from these results and also from my undergrad courses, but it was very interesting to me and I wanted to learn more when I was doing it. So it was um, a little bit interesting um, hearing your folks take on this. Um, but we've identified that there is a lack of understanding and there's this perceived lack of value of digital technologies. I know uh, you mentioned, Canon, that you have some feeders who don't even have cell phones. So these can be major barriers in terms of adopting any sort of digital technologies. How do you think these perceptions can be addressed? Um, and that way we can have a wider adoption of digital technologies across the board. Again. Anybody who wants to jump yeah. in. <laughs> so, so one thing that has to be said is not every technology is right for every farm. And so, and a lot of these technologies are designed for, I don't say Norwegian salmon farms, but a lot mm. of them are, are designed with salmon farms in mind. And salmon is a slightly higher value product than rainbow trout. And typically, especially in Norway, they use larger pens. And so there's just more value in one production unit and it makes it easier to um, accommodate that capital cost, but also the benefits are extrapolated over more fish, more value. And so it's it's more worthwhile to get that 1% improvement, 2% improvement, whatever it is. Um, whereas for a salmon, uh, sorry, um, an Ontario trout farm, which may be smaller, um, you still have that burden of training staff, of exploring new tools, finding out if they're right for you. And I, I think a lot of them are right for for some of the farms here, um, but it's just sort of harder to, to get that uh, initial hurdle of incorporating it and seeing the value because it's a lot of them are supposed to streamline your processes. So if you're struggling to train people, if you haven't quite incorporated yet, um, it is hard to see that value because sometimes you're still running both systems. You're using your farm management software, but then you're also still collecting data in Excel and transcribing it or, writing stuff down on paper sheets and then somebody transcribes it. And until you sort of incorporate the whole process, uh, you're not really seeing those benefits. And even if you are seeing those benefits, it might take 18 months until you harvest that crop and you can actually look at the data and say like, oh yeah, we, you know, we did get a 5% benefit. And, um, and it might be small and hard to see when you're just looking at that in the interim and you have to sort of look at these larger uh, time scales to actually perceive that benefit. So it, it is kind of difficult. And I, I think the solution is a, like I said, a lot of the technologies are new. So as time goes by, we'll have more examples, we'll have more data and we'll have more case studies that we can look at and say, um, you know, this example is probably transferable to your use case. Here's what they did. Here's how long it took. Here's the benefits that they saw. And, and we can take those examples from the Atlantic salmon industry where there's just a lot more operators and a lot more examples and they're a little further ahead in uh, adoption of technology. So hopefully we'll see that soon, but it, it is an issue because I understand why it's hard for, for um, the Ontario farmers to sort of see that value and get excited. Exactly. I, I would agree a lot with what you said, Tyler. It's like farms need to definitely see the value in the tech to justify those costs. And and it all seems to come down to efficiency. It's not like we're going to be missing something that we're not doing now. It's just 
if we can reduce the administrative work, then that's more important to keep the managers or whatever out on the site, workers out on the site and less times doing administrative data entry stuff, that kind of stuff, processing the data, how to interpret the data. So I think the less time you spend actually doing, like you said, as soon as you fully commit to a, a software, you spend less time handling numbers and Excel sheets and stuff yeah. yourself. And you spend it's more time actually thing, worrying about the fish. Yeah. There's also a barrier of just um, having cash on hand and having time available. So if all your staff is working 24 seven already, it's hard to set that time aside. And if you know you ever had some extra money, some extra time, then maybe you could adopt these technologies, but it's just hard to say like, all right, we're gonna do this now, um, we're bought in. You know, it's it's hard to sort of take that time and that um, that energy to do that. Um, and, I saw and, that's, and that's actually really important because if you've ever, um, if anybody's ever familiar with the implementation of things like ERP systems in companies, um, yeah. they take, they're a massive headache to set up. Nobody wants to do it, but everybody understands that they need to do it. Like it needs to become more efficient. Everything needs to be standardized. Um, but it takes again, somebody decision maker to say, no, this is what we're doing. We buy in that you have to like, we're going to buy in. Yes. It's going to take us time to get going. And I think what happens, and it and it, it it happens a lot of time, and it happens with us as well, is a company starts is like, okay, we want to try your software, right? It's going to make a hopefully it's going to make, you've shown us that it can be more efficient for data entry for comparing and contrasting performance on on different between sites between cages, et cetera, et cetera. But that initial startup time would be it two months, three months, four months, whatever it is to onboard somebody and get them using it employees will generally they have a hard, might have a hard time with it and that whole like okay this is frustrating or it's taking too much time out of my day because not only have i got to keep doing what i do normally but now i've got to learn this new thing and start using this and unless you can oftentimes with this kind of technology unless you can show instant results it gets harder and harder to keep going whereas this what we're doing and what tyler mentioned like you've got the whole cycle you've got a longer cycle and in, in a growing period in in cold water fish that Oftentimes, it's not until the end of the cycle that you can say, okay, it's, this wasn't just a more efficient way to get data into our system, but it also saved us X amount of feed, X amount of dollars. Like These are all the savings that we got when we've got a harvest report with all the information. But that initial baby steps, that training period is the bit that needs to be um, less frustrating or much easier to see some sort of results or wins early on to be able to justify it because at the end it's like if we have to wait all this time until we can see whether there's any results then it's harder i think for companies to keep going and staff start getting frustrated well is this helping us or not because it's just taking me too much time at the moment absolutely and like you said because of our our seasonality january february march those are basically the only months that we can dedicate that chunk of time to establishing a setup and and dealing with large bulks of data and and establishing this kind of stuff but spring and fall forget it there's there's no time yeah um going back to the first question it it does sort of require um a situation that's excited and ready to accept that type of solution and uh just as a quick anecdote i worked at a farm and uh and and they had some new software i forget which one it was and they were and they had their guy inputting data and uh oh sorry no <laughs> they were just using excel sheets and he would he would write his data down on a piece of paper and then he'd take out his cell phone and use the calculator and calculate uh whatever data he had to put in and then he'd put it into excel and i watched him do that and i i just saw like it, it's just not a fit here and and luckily, I think in Ontario, you know, that's, that's sort of an extreme example. We do have the aptitude to utilize technologies effectively. Um, Stephen, you mentioned using the mobile phone for data input, um, just reducing that transcription process. I think it is there, but it, it does require sort of a, a champion and somebody who's willing to push to see it through such that any little um, inefficiencies that you take with any new tech uh, get ironed out and you get to the point where it actually creates a more streamlined process and hopefully other advantages 
you know, less feed wastage, uh, whatever, depending on what technologies we're talking about. Um, it does take a while and, and can, uh, you know, maybe it's, it's a matter of you guys sitting down with the supplier and saying, when does it make sense? What does a, um, a phase in roadmap look like? Um, cause to just sell you something is, is probably not setting any of us up for success. And there needs to be more planning on the, uh, the phase in there. I think that like the, that whole planning thing, I think that's something that a lot of like, I don't know if it's, we can say companies, but that's not something that's really thought of. It's here's the product, purchase the product, use the product. There's no, how do you integrate the product to effectively work? Um, so there is a question in the chat from Professor Burrow, um, and he asks, how do we quantify the benefit of technology and potential return on investment, so ROI, um, notably for small industries like the Ontario rainbow trout industry? In a large industry, you can contrast and compare, but in our case, the industry is small, so it's a bit harder. Do you have to look at the improvement over time um, or compare one site versus the other? How would you... What are folks thought on that? <laughs> so for a larger company, if we work with Grieg or Cook or, or Moe, they have different regions, they have different sites, and that's what they do. They roll out these solutions at one site, and then they see how it compares against a similar site. And, and most Ontario producers don't have that ability. If you install technologies at only one pen, you know, you haven't really created efficiency in processes. There's so much random variance in the performance of any pen that you're not going to see anything. And, and so it does make it difficult. And, and like I said before, it can take, you know, a year to two years before you get full cycle data and you can look at it. And, and so it's hard. And, and like we've also said, it takes a couple months until you're actually at a state where you can see the end result of adopting these technologies. So a lot of it is is sort of taking a leap of faith and looking at how other farms and other industries have improved and saying, I don't see why we couldn't see those same improvements. We just need to sort of make a commitment to, te uh, to the technology. And the other difficulty is that larger farms, they collect more data. So they have, um, you know, time invested in each activity. Um, often they outsource a lot of their activities, harvest, net cleaning, all that kind of stuff is outsourced. And so you have your your total expense for those activities. Um, feed is more tightly monitored, all those things. And so you can get those sort of fine uh, improvements because you have the data to do so. And if you're collecting data just manually or just, you know, you just say, how many bags did we use instead of how many kilograms did we use? Um, you might not have the data to support that analysis or get the resolution that you need to actually see the improvement. Um, so it is difficult, but it, it is possible, you know, collecting that data is just a matter of setting up your systems to collect it. And uh, digital technologies can help with that. <laughs> um, if you're collecting your feed data on your phone, you do it then and there um, to get a scale in there and weigh your feed bag before and after. Um, it adds work. I don't want to say like it doesn't add work, uh, but hopefully it adds value. And it, it it probably comes down to the scale of the operation. You know, it, it it doesn't make sense for everybody. These solutions are not for everybody, but I think they are for a lot of the, uh, certainly the net pen farmers in Ontario. Um, and maybe it's just about technology transfer. Um, you can talk to Innovacy, you can talk to your neighbors, you can talk to your other producers. Um, a lot of people have connections with the East Coast uh, salmon farmers and just say, how are you doing it? What is worthwhile? What are you excited about? Um, and a lot of them will tell you about processes that are ongoing and they haven't made a decision on yet uh, because there's a lot of new tech technology coming out. Um, but in my mind, it's hard and, and that's how you have to do it. You have to set yourself up to collect the data and then you have to have a person whose job it is to look at that data. And it's it's not easy, but it it should pay off because we're we're seeing it in other sectors of the industry. Um, I think it is a great question and it's extremely difficult to answer. I mean, at the farm level, we're always assessing ourselves on FCR and um, just taking a snapshot of one year is just impossible almost to compare against any other year. We do um, a full analysis every winter, like I said, January, February, March is a good time when we can dedicate a large chunk of our time to analyzing our own data and 
you know, we reflect back on your classes and, you know, where the fish came from, um, what egg source were they? What hatchery, specific hatchery were they grown in? What size did we get them? What was the water temperature? Right now we're having a record year. So we're, we're literally in the process of writing down and recording everything that has happened since those fish went into the water and actually before, like when they were eggs and trying to trace it back, like what were the factors? But if you implement, you know, a digital technology in that time, it's just one component that's going into that. You know, we had some phenomenal water temperatures. We had good health. We had a whole bunch of stuff. So it's recording everything and, and, you know, pointing the finger one direction over the other is not always, I mean, it's not a hundred percent. You're never going to be able to say, oh, it's because we only hit 25 degrees for water temperature. Well, we also stocked less fish or whatever. So, I mean, quantifying that is almost next to impossible. We will, we will get the same fingerlings from the same egg source side by side in like in the farm setup and they will perform differently which makes no sense they came from the same raceway or whatever but so I mean that kind of stuff is so difficult to do we do like to trace it over time so I think to get any sort of concrete evidence that it's helping you would definitely have to track it over years so you need to see how it's performing in the good times like now and then also when we're going to hit 26 and 27 degrees again and and see you know are we still getting better FCRs and that kind of thing over time so that I think that's the only way that we'd be able to do it is just like long term viewpoints. I think that that's very important. What you're saying is is the fact that even when you're a company is thinking of trying a new technology, and 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 as Tyler's already said, like one technology isn't for everybody. Every every farm has different needs. Is to be able to define what it is that you what value it is you want to see in anything new that you're going to try, and how are you going to measure that. And as you just mentioned, there's a point where you might want to just compare, and as, as Dominic is asking, you might want to compare cage to cage now. Like, why is this one outperforming the other one? What's going on with this cage that we need to fix right now? Um, but also having that long-term projection in mind of saying, okay, well, how are we, are we improving year over year kind of thing? But until you can properly define your needs now, like what is it, what is value to me today? Right. What is it that I need to really show or need to be able to improve on today so that then I can actually start looking at the long term plan? Or is it that I'm not interested in what's happening today? And then but until you can define those metrics that you need to measure that are metrics for value, then you can not adequately decide what kind of technology you need to implement. I love that I'm seeing questions coming up in the chat, but I want to kind of. Uh, the questions are, uh, again, another really good segue into the next set of questions that I have, because we've talked, you know, about data collection and things like that. And I think in recent years, everybody can agree that there's been more of an emphasis on, you know, your data privacy and who actually owns the data that you're storing, particularly in like when you're using software like this. Um, so the survey results that we have suggest that farmers aren't really concerned about data ownership and third party data use in relation to digital adoption technology. Um, but as you know, this might change. So how should data ownership and third party data use become, or sorry, should data ownership and third party data use become more significant factors um, or not? Because I think that's a really good way to kind of get into the questions that are being asked in the chat. So kind of shifting the focus, data privacy. Data um, yeah, we're, I mean, I like to think we're very transparent with a lot of our stuff, like literally, if you walk into my farm right now in the office, I've got a chart on the wall right here that shows every cage. And as it gets emptied, you know, our FCR and stuff. And that was just brought to my attention again. Recently, we had a tour and somebody that knew about FCRs came in and they, they made the point. You guys are very transparent here. You like everything's on the walls. If you want to see our data, if anybody calls, the MNR asks or whatever, you know, we, we will provide it. The problem becomes let's say we take pictures because a lot of software programs would have like the ability to upload a photo and connect it to a page. So you have like a sick fish. We've got some culminaris in their gills. It got yellow or whatever. It looks bad. You put the picture online and what if that ends up getting breached? And then, you know, you could have somebody from PETA or something, somebody getting a hold of these pictures saying like, look at these fish that are in the water. And it's like, well, I mean, things in the wrong hands can get blown out of control. And that's when it gets scary. 
It, it's an excellent point. It it comes up more and more, and we see it in other industries a lot. There's been a couple examples in aquaculture that have been very damaging to the farms. Um, and it, it really comes down to having a trusted supplier. And then a lot of the larger farms have a, a CTO or somebody sort of in that role, even if that's not their title, because it's, um, yeah, there's value in the data. Um, I, I think there was even um, uh, just like a cybersecurity attack. Somebody um, didn't like the farms and they went in to just mess with their systems. And, and this was a RAS farm. So everything's, you know, all the oxygen is controlled by a, a central system. And if it gets screwed up, it, it can be devastating. Um, this is not my area of expertise, so I, I shouldn't comment too much. But um, yeah, using a trusted technology supplier and then having your own uh, tech expert to protect yourself is is really what needs to happen. We do. Also, I mean, I was just no, going to say that we, we were, I mean, working globally, it's one of the it's one of the probably the most popular questions we get when people are talking about maybe implementing or thinking of implementing our software is who owns the data? Where's the data stored? Like, and that whole kind of like, so what server it is on and the rest of it. A lot of it is, is the thought comes from, I don't want my competitors seeing how well we're doing, right? Because it's very competitive. Globally, the aquaculture industry is quite competitive as well. Perhaps less of an issue in the Ontario industry being smaller and dominic actually i was just i'm reading some of the comments coming through mentioned a success story which kind of looks at this as well from a data sharing standpoint of the the dairy industry in ontario that has done an, and the dairy industry in general has done a really good job of sharing data and using data across an industry to improve the industry right and benchmarking dairy cows globally and, and all that kind of stuff and and so there's there's a risk or there's that thought of like, what can people do with my data if it gets out? And that's why we have things like GDPR and all of the personal data protection that's in place now globally and laws about what we can and cannot put online personally when we're talking about a, an employee or a company. But then when it comes to production data, et cetera, it's also a competitive industry and you don't, and, and people are trying to protect against, well, my neighbor understanding how or my competitor understanding how well I do things and then they go and do it and then they out compete me in the market because they've stolen my secrets right and getting access to our production data and I think that message or the industry that has tech needs to do a better message a better job of selling that kind of like story and saying like like this isn't about um that kind of data insecurity there are also messages that and, and we use it sometimes simply and we say well the bank online i mean your, your most your financial personal financial information which is your most maybe risky information to put out there you use online banking right and we use the same technology to protect data as online banks do um and so it, it's it's about messaging and how it, i think and how it, can you like dispel some of the fears surround what's going to happen with my data um the other fears then that 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 uh, ken is talking about with what happens if that data gets into like that we've got that sick fish then that photo gets shared and then it gets taken out of proportion and then gets used by popular media to attack the industry is 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 also something that we need to be aware of but in the terms of data sharing um we need to do a better job of letting customers know that we don't actually share people's data we're not about sharing like your data versus with their data and but there is an important component to being willing to um share data across an industry in an anonymous fashion to be able to benchmark and improve an industry and not just look at, well, this is about our farm. No, this is about the industry. Can we improve the industry? And can the Ontario trout farming industry become more competitive? And if we have access to data, we can help the industry grow that way. I really like these takes on it because it's, I feel like a lot of times when like, you know, you do surveys and you ask questions like that, or the questions sometimes we forget to take like real world applications and just like I like that you're using like online banking everybody does it like even now you do everything from your phone everything's online um so just because I am I want to recognize that it is a very busy time of the year for folks and we have a lot of folks in here um I'm gonna open the floor for questions and what I'll do is I'll start awesome. going through the questions in the chat um, but if anybody wants to unmute, you can just, I guess you could just raise your hand so that way we can take them in order. Um, so the first one from Professor Rowe, and that's kind of what made me segue into 
data privacy because he talked about sharing data. So I'll just I'll just read the whole thing. Um, one of the success stories is in the dairy industry. That industry made lots of relative that industry is made up of lots of relatively small operations. Production monitoring, sharing of the data, adoption of most advanced data analysis techniques, and benchmarking of pro production of cows and farms. These have been extremely effective processes that have supported very significant improvement of the product productivity of animals and farms. Can something like that be implemented for the Ontario trout farming industry? No, I think Ontario is different that, you know, we're kind of, we look at ourselves being all in the same basket. We don't want a single farm to fail because that looks bad on all of us, you know, and, and aqua, the whole industry should be like that. You know, is if one farm fails majorly, that's in the news. That's aquaculture. That's not one farm. That's aquaculture. But I think there needs to be more sharing of that kind of information. I get it. There's some proprietary stuff. I don't, I don't, uh, you know, want to forget about that. I totally understand. But I think there needs to be more sharing of information at that level. And I think it benefits everybody. You know, we, we can't meet the demand. So that's not that's not a main concern for us. I, I understand it can be different globally, but yeah, I think more data sharing would be very important. Tyler, do you have anything? Yeah, to that's a very good point. And we kind of have the mechanisms in place already. Um, you know, I've met Canada a couple of times and it's it's just from the the industry conferences. Um, the vibe is it's pretty open sharing. If you ask people what they're doing, they tell you. If you ask people specific numbers, FCR, like Canna said, they they often just tell you. Um, so it, it sort of is a unique opportunity to to do that. And it, it's not just data. It's, you know, what are you trying? What's working? Um, even visiting farms, which maybe there's a biosecurity risk, but uh, people generally seem open to that, which is very healthy and, and good to see. Is can I, so. I think there's a, a bit of a difference, though, between what we might say verbally to each other about, yeah, this is what's happening, to be able it to then, maybe to Dominic's point, is is there opportunity for the industry in Ontario to use a data collection system, whatever it is, whoever it is, to be able to then openly benchmark performance so that companies know well this is how my is for my farm is performing against the rest of the industry this is how i mean because i mean being around the world working in aquaculture industry globally you talk to people like yeah they're in, a, in a meeting or sitting at a conference i'd be like yeah this is my fcrs is somewhere around here but well, can we see your data well, yeah no i mean no it's so I think it's fantastic and it would be great to see. And I think probably Ontario is a good market to be able to do it in um, and be quite transparent. But if the proof is in the pudding, as Dominic likes to say quite often, is uh, of whether or not the industry could make the um, inroads to be able to say, OK, we want to benchmark the performance of our industry and improve the industry as a whole. And that's going to retake a massive data sharing operation like to be there has it. been um benchmark um benchmarking tools used before um i think I believe actually dominic had a student go around i don't I think it was like eight years ago ten years ago now and um another company too had another individual going around um the some of the things like you learn um from that is just what <clears throat> what useful information do you actually get out of it so if a site's you know, doesn't benchmark well, how do we improve it? What's going on? A lot of that seems to go back to temperatures or health concerns or that kind of stuff. And that kind of sharing is useful. And now, I mean, just being in Ontario as it is now, the company that owns us owns seven other sites, you know, or six other sites. So we have a lot of sharing information going on. And we also share that with other companies as well. Um, just because we all, all want to be working together towards the same goal. Like um, recently we had the lactococcus stuff. I don't know if anybody is aware of that, but you know, that hit a couple sites. Everybody's aware of it. Everybody be, um, is now on the uh, lookout for it. There is a surveillance project for it. Um, so we all try to help one another and it, it helps the whole industry in Ontario because you know, they got a vaccine out in record time for this kind of thing. But having 
sharing of that kind of information is incredibly useful for us. If there's like the disease surveillance stuff, it's like remarkable what that can do. And you don't want it to impact the whole industry. You're helping each other out in the long run. But the benchmark stuff, I mean, if you have one site that's underperforming, you could delve deeper into what's causing that because we basically all get our eggs from the same source. Like, is it what's going on at the site? That kind of stuff. Making sure that like calculations, if it's a, like a new site or somebody that doesn't, hasn't had a lot of time managing, like, are they making sure that this has happened before? Are they even calculating their information correctly? Like that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's just, it can be a challenge to benchmark because it's just what information do you want to get out of it? That's going to be useful for them. That's interesting that, that, and they, it, it, it seemed like you were a little frustrated as you were saying, like it's happened before we've tried, like we've done, like there's been a couple of initiatives that have happened and, but the, the, the value wasn't demonstrated in the. One was the, good. Like, one was bad. Right. Dominic's and, was great. Okay. <laughs> was great. You, don't, you don't have to be nice because he's on the phone. Um, no, it's true. It's true. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but yes, I think that that's, an, that's actually a very important point that you've made is, and, and your reaction was that, for whatever reason it's not been continual one one was good one was bad and we didn't we maybe as an industry didn't get the value out of it we thought we might be to actually keep it going like in other industries such as like the dairy industry as dominic's pointing out so. amazing okay i love that we have such amazing discussion but like yes i am just I recognize everybody's time. So there's one more question to wrap it up um, super quickly from Professor Ataharu. Um, so in supporting adoption of technology in farms, there's new understanding that of how trust influences the process in addition to the human relationships, material relationships, such as farms and farmers relationships with digital technology play a key role. Do you see the same as farmers might relate more to certain technologies over other technologies in the trout industry? Um, what are folks' feelings on that? Just to wrap us up, final thoughts. Um, Sorry, it's about the trust in it? I was just... Yeah, so about the trust, um, like how trust influences the processes. Um, so farms and farmers relating with digital technology. So, I mean, certain technologies, and this um, it sounds like the broad question, if I'm interpreting the question correctly, um, certain technologies that don't require you a, a lot of trust in what's happening with your data, et cetera, because it's just like, um, you know, it, the data isn't going anywhere. It's not being potentially being shared with other people. It might be around that trust, like certain feeders, for example, it's all, everything stays there in-house, feed it. It's all in the feeder. We get the information out of it. We don't have to share it with anybody. It's not in a cloud. It's not part of a, a bigger digital system. Um, but there might be a different kind of trust of whether or not the system that you're buying into actually does what it says it's going to do, right? If I invest in this automatic feeder, is it really going to help me feed more precisely and lower my FCRs and my feeding cost? So there's trust in what we're selling to the industry, whether it's actually going to do what give provide the value that we're um, looking to get out of it. And then there's the level of trust of, well, that whole data issue that we've just been talking about. So I think that it getting understanding and trusting the value that we're providing and that return on the investment might be something that we also need to do a better job of providing to the industry so that they can adopt technology. I hope okay. I've interpreted the question right, but it yeah. seems that you know, what kind yeah, of technology it... is more trusting than others or more trustworthy than others. Um, and does anybody have any final thoughts that they want to share? I have one more question that I'm going to ask really quickly and it's more directed at Canada, but I just want to give you folks the opportunity if you have any comments on the results that were presented or anything like that. This is probably preaching to the choir, but a lot of these problems are things that government funding would be very appropriate to resolve. Um, there are a lot, there are some funding programs which are very helpful. Um, and, you know, Guelph is sort of the leading academic institution, of course, is facilitating a lot of that. Um, so yeah, roll your eyes, tell me if you heard this before, but a lot of things in other countries, these problems are being tackled with government funding support. And that would be very appropriate here. Okay. Anyone else? And then I have it's it's just one question that's directed at Canada, but I think everyone might have. 
something they would want to add to it. Um, so this is from um, Dr. Kabir, but do you have any recent examples of digital technology that you have either adopted or rejected? Um, so what was your reasoning? So if you've adopted it, rejected it, why? <laughs> um, we have had over the years, several companies present to us and, and their software. Um, and you know, when it comes down to actually picking one, it it seems to come down to how easy it is to use and how easy it is to set up. And um, obviously the cost too. Um, if, if it's something that's very extensive and I mean, obviously we talked about this, but another chat, like when they talk about access to your data, a lot of concerns for the fish farmers is, okay, we enter all of our stuff into Excel now. That's like the main part of Ontario is doing that kind of thing, right? So let's say we stop using a company. Where is that data? Because we still want to be able to have access to it. So that's like a big concern, obviously, too. So we wouldn't go with a company, you know, that we lose our data for however mm -hmm. long we're with a company for. We have to still have access to that. Um, uh, a success, we we use temperature probes now, and that's through uh, Anovacy. And I've got one actually charging right beside me that we just got. It's, um, they're incredibly useful for us because now I can access it online. And before I used to have to go down the dock and, you know, I would get a picture of the profile several times throughout the day, but that still takes my time to go out there um, and, you know, go to every depth or whatever that I want to get these snapshots at. Because, I mean, anybody that's recorded temperature, you can't just do it at every it takes time for the temperature to, so it ends up taking a large chunk of my day sometimes to do these profiles. So it's something as simple as just a temperature profile. Um, I have these probes set up across the farm and now that they've got alarms and everything, just earlier this week, an alarm went off and I called the night watchman to make sure blowers and stuff were on. Incredibly useful. So instead of, and, and they go off as often as you want and you'd set a schedule. So, I mean, instead of just getting one snapshot throughout the day, I get one at every hour, one every half an hour, that kind of thing. That was very useful for us. So I saw huge value in that kind of thing. Um, but as in terms of failures, we have rejected other companies just because the initial setup, we didn't see we were going to be getting very much benefit from. Um, the growth model wasn't geared towards rainbow trout. So we weren't going to get any useful information. It was just basically going to be an easier way to enter feed, which I didn't see much value in. And for the cost associated with that, it wasn't useful for us. Um, basically just cutting down on administrative time and increasing actual farm time is the goal, I think, for a lot of this and, and seeing the efficiency. So like, I didn't want to draw away from, you know, um, I noticed Dom's comment is like, yeah, you could compare cages and it would help identify where you're lacking and that sort of thing that, that is useful and where you could improve. Maybe you're, you're underfeeding cages and that, and you don't want to do that either. <clears throat> Thank you so much, folks, for your insights, your knowledge, your time. Um, so I would like to thank everybody for coming. Um, our panelists, thank you so much for the discussion. I feel like we can keep going, but I know everyone, they're, everyone's very busy. Um, so my closing thoughts, um, I know Dr. Kabir, he had mentioned his next survey that will be coming out. So keep an eye on your emails and where the surveys are sent out. We will have a public recording of this that will be released. Um, I'm not sure when, but it will be released. I'm gonna point to Dr. Kabir for that uh, when it will be out, but I just want to, Thank everybody and hope you all are staying, you know, warm, enjoying the weather. And if you're, I know Stephen, you're on vacation, so enjoy any vacations. Thank you. Thank you for hosting us, Ishaka.